Unfortunately, COVID hit our church this week, so I would ask you to please be in prayer, specifically for the Reese family. Because of this, our service this week was canceled, which is why I'm bringing you this lesson via video. Now, if you've been following along with the lessons that I've been teaching the last several months, this should be a review for you. But if not, this won't be at all hard to follow. We've covered some of the passages that we'll be in today in the last several months, so this should be seen as a review, but not as a review only. You see, based off of these beautiful truths that we've learned so far from Scripture, and before we expound upon or advance in our biblical study, this is a message of thanksgiving. When we think about Thanksgiving, Norman Rockwell-type gatherings, warm fireplaces, tacky sweaters, uh, football games, and sweet memories with friends and family often come to mind. But when we look around us at the realities of life, these hallmark feelings can quickly dissipate. The stock market's down and gas prices have been at a record high. Inflation is stepping out like it's trying to impress us and prices on everything are through the roof. And the tendency can be to ask, why me? Last month, Reagan and I went from being pregnant to a miscarriage. And a fellow pastor friend of mine, a guy I grew up with, his two-year-old son died from COVID. And the tendency can be to ask, why me? At this time of year, the cynic within us begins to emerge when we bring up Thanksgiving. And though I fully understand the pains of life, being that I'm in no way removed from them, we must be incredibly careful to keep our perspectives locked in the proper position and never look to God with discontent, asking, why me? During a discussion panel, this question was asked, and Dr. R.C. Sproul answered. I'm going to read that question for you here in his response. The question was this. Since God is slow to anger and patient, then why, when man first sinned, was his wrath and punishment so severe and long-lasting? I'm going to read that for you one more time. Since God is slow to anger and patient, then why, when man first sinned, was his wrath and punishment so severe and long-lasting? This was R.C. Sproul's answer. That God's punishment for Adam was so severe? This creature from the dirt defied the everlasting holy God after that God had said the day that you shall eat of it you shall surely die and instead of dying Thanatos that day he lived another day and was clothed in his nakedness by pure grace and had the consequences of a curse applied for quite some time but the worst curse came upon the one who seduced him whose head would be crushed by the seed of the woman and the punishment was too severe What's wrong with you people? I'm serious. I mean, this is what's wrong with the Christian church today. We don't know who God is and we don't know who we are. The question is, why wasn't it infinitely more severe? If we have any understanding of our sin and any understanding of who God is, that's the question, isn't it? It's a wonderful answer. You see, there's a reason for the sufferings that we face in life. And the reason is sin. Now, this is not to say that we had a miscarriage because of some specific sin in our lives, nor that my friend's son died because of some specific sin of his parents. That is not at all what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that death and heartache, misery and turmoil, desperation and depression, pain and misery, are all present in this world because of sin. What we're talking about here is what we deserve, what we as humanity rightly deserve. Turn with me to Romans chapter 3. We start in verse 10. You see, whether we're discussing individual struggles, social justice and reform, or the general state of sinful man, what we as mankind deserve is death. For sinning against the eternally holy God, the result is physical death and an eternity in hell, which we rightly deserve. 
How many times have you sinned in your life? How many times have you sinned today? And do you know that one sin is deserving of an eternity in hell? That's what you deserve. That's what I deserve. That's what I deserve. Like Bodhi Balkum says, do you know that it was mercy that woke you up this morning because his judgment should have killed you last night? Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. You see that man was created in God's image, but due to their own fault, Adam and Eve sinned against God. Now man is fallen, lost, totally depraved, and separated from God. Read with me Romans chapter 3, starting at verse 10. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use, they use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. And in their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Romans plainly tells us that all have sinned. And the wages of sin is death. And on our own it's needless to say. Our condition is hopeless. Now, after understanding what we deserve, we must also understand the right of God. God is the creator and we are his creation, created for his glory alone. You see, there was nothing. But then God said, let there be light. God spoke into existence every fiber of the fabric of reality in which we live, and he did it all for his glory. There is no one who can call God's hand on anything, nor if they could, would they need to, because God is before all things. In him, all things hold together, and in his perfect, active, absolute sovereignty, God is perfect, perfectly holy. Everything he does, though we don't always understand it, and everything God does, God is good and perfect and perfectly holy. Because of God's holiness, the only way a person will go to heaven when they die is if they are perfect and holy like Christ. But on our own, I hope you know that this is an impossibility because no one is perfect but Christ, but God. But this is why Christ died in our place. You see, we've been talking about the doctrine of substitution, that Christ was the substitute for us in our place. He paid for our sins on the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He, being God the Father, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin, to take our sin on the cross so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He took our place. So what does God owe us? Nothing. Nothing. Romans 9.20 says, But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, Why have you made me like this? Of course not. So in spite of what we deserve and in spite of God's right, let's talk about what he gives us, his children, instead. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Again, Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but... The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You've got to love those but God parts. Dr. David Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, But God, these two words in and of themselves, in a sense, contain the whole of the gospel. There is what we deserve and there is God's holy right, what he has the right to do. And then, there is what he gives us, his children, instead. Grace. 
Read with me in Ephesians chapter 2, starting at verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not a result of work so that no one may boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them this thanksgiving instead of looking at the difficulties and heartaches in life and asking God why me let's look to God understanding who we are and who he is Understanding who God is and what we deserve in relation and ask, Holy God Almighty, in spite of who I am, why me? John MacArthur said this, If you have light, life, it is from God. If you have light, it is from God. If you have sight, it is from God. If you have understanding, it is from God. If you have repentance, it is from God. If you have joy, it is from God. If you have faith to embrace Christ, it is from God. It is the work of God. God alone can give life. God alone can regenerate. And it is the power of God alone that brings life to the sinner. Our every blessing comes from the Father of lights. Though we don't always understand God, understand that your holy father is always in control. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. This Thanksgiving, let's understand who we are and who God is. And let's thank him for his infinite love and mercy. Just like the pilgrims who had arrived in a new world in 1620 and didn't exactly know what God had in store for their future. Let's trust God just as they did here at Grace Church of the Carolinas. Let's stand firmly on the word of God and be forever rejoicing at the blessings that God has bestowed and will bestow upon us. The like Philippians 4, 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say, rejoice. Starting your list with your salvation, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and praise God for what he has done.